So I, what, I, what I thought I'd share with you this morning, um, I don't have an introduction story to today's story, but what I want to share was something I was thinking about. I went for a long drive today looking for waves and ended up driving home with dry hair. But I was listening to some lectures while I was driving, and it got me thinking about something. I want to share it with you guys based on a, um, a comment a Christian friend made to me a couple years ago uh, that I just want to share with you. This is what he said. He said, uh, we were talking about like politics, philosophy, and religion. And he said this. He goes, well, of course, I'm coming from it from the complete brainwashed um, Christian side of things because I'm, I'm deep in the cult, right? And we both kind of laughed at that, right? You get kind of the humor like we're in a cult, we're in the cult of Christianity, and we've all been brainwashed, right? But so we kind of laughed about it, but I started thinking about it based on a, a scripture which I'll share with you in just a second. And we were kind of making fun of ourselves, and yet what I want to share with you this morning is he's kind of correct, actually. And here's what I mean by that. We are all influenced by our environment, right? So here's the thing. Before I was a Christian, um, say prior to age, what did I get saved at age 25 or 26? I would say this. I was completely in the camp of what you would call human secularism, right? Secular, I should say secular. What did I say? Human secularism? That's pretty funny, actually. It's actually secular humanism is the term, right? I was straight up in the cult of secular humanism based upon my upbringing, my college education. And that is this sort of belief that maybe there is a transcendent God, but if there is one, we really don't know him, and everybody's got their, right, their own opinion. You know, classic, well, live out your truth, and what you believe is true for you, and therefore it's true for you, and blah, 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 blah. Or you're an agnostic, I don't really know. I'm, there's some trans or you could even be an atheist. I don't believe in any God whatsoever. This is it. Humans are really, you know, are up, it's up to us to make our own destiny, right? Secular humanism. So I was a sort of dyed-in-the-wool secular humanist. And then I get turned on to Jesus Christ, right? I have, an, I have an, a moment with him, and I realize he's true. And so I start reading the Bible, and I don't even believe a lot of it at first. I'm very skeptical about it. And eventually, I come face to face with this idea that both ideas can't be true. I can't be both a secular humanist who chooses to believe in one particular way of belief, and I happen to believe in Christianity. It doesn't match with what the Bible says, because the Bible says it is absolute truth, and there is no other truth. And I couldn't hold both of those things in my tiny little brain. But what I came to realize was two things. One is I was going to have to let go of my secular humanism if I wanted to grow as a Christian. And number two, quite frankly, the description of reality from the Bible makes way more sense than secular humanism. So there's a few great major questions that people want to ask themselves, which is, how did all of this creation get here? What formed it? <laughs> what formed me, right? What happens when I die? And is there any meaning behind anything we're doing here, right? There's maybe more questions than that, but quite frankly, these are the four that occurred to me today while I was driving home after not catching any waves. Four major questions. And so what I want to submit to you this morning is everybody has an idea about those four different things, right? And secular humanism certainly has some ideas about those things as well. And so when my friend says to me, but I am now in the Christian cult, I will tell you this, over the last, what would that be, 30 odd years, by studying the Bible, I quite literally have been reshaping my brain. Because... Be renewed by the transforming of your mind. Be renewed by the, well, it's, yeah, be, be re no, be transformed by the, yeah, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And science actually teaches us that in learning new thoughts and believing new ways and focusing in certain areas, you actually form new neurotrans, ne what is it, neuro, Transmitters. what? Neurotransmitters. Transmitters, right, pathways, neuro neurotransmitting pathways in your brain. And here's the thing, you could look at that in a negative sense and say, oh, you're just a brainwashed member of the Christian cult, yeah? But I believe, the op I believe just the opposite. I believe that this is truth. And what I've been doing over the last 30 odd years is cr 
transforming, really, my life being transformed by renewing my mind because I believe this is actually the truth. And everything out there, which is the world we live in, is also trying to shape our brains. Why am I saying all this to you? It has nothing to do with today's teaching. I just thought it'd be fun to start out by saying that, like, let's renew our brains this morning, right? Let's jump into God's word, look at the truth, and let it shape our minds, because I believe we're shaping our minds into what is ultimately true, and that way when we leave here, what do you leave, May 19th or whatever? That's so sad, I won't be here to say goodbye. Oh, shame. Um, <laughs> the idea is we leave here changed people. We, we've actually altered the way we think so that we can go engage a world that doesn't believe what we believe, but we can be instruments of God's truth out in that world. Does that make sense? Okay, how's that for a little mini lecture to start that doesn't have anything to do with today's teaching because we have a short teaching. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your life-changing word, Lord. Quite literally, your word that changes our brains, God. We invite you to do that to us today. God, go ahead and start digging those neurotransmitting pathways or whatever the way you do it by, by teaching us truth, Lord, that um, we can be better warriors for you, as it were, in a world of falsehoods around us. We ask this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay, last time we got together, Jesus calmed the storm. The disciples combined fear with don't you care. Don't you care, Jesus, that we're going to drown. And that kind of lightweight fear and that maybe accusation against Jesus of don't you care is replaced by full-on terror when Jesus calms the storm. Not only does he shut off the winds, but he has the power to flatten the waves. Remember, if you're a surfer, you understand, or a fisherman, you understand why that would actually freak them out. They're actually terrified of Jesus at that moment, and it causes them to ask, who is he? What is he capable of? And then, does he care? Okay, three big questions you can ask yourself on your own time. Okay, so today we're just going to do a very simple story of Jesus casting out demons from a man, throwing them into a herd of pigs, and then running off a cliff. Most of you are pretty familiar with this story already, but we're going to kind of dissect it a little bit. So, they continue sailing. What's that? Yeah, the, yeah, not dissecting pigs, no. But verse 20, okay, we're in Luke chapter 8, verse 26. They sailed to the region of Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. Now, really briefly, remember the last story, they were in a storm, the storm is calmed, but it's kind of cool, they continue sailing. Now, what's interesting is where they go. This region of Gerasenes is actually, oh, we're going to have to do this again. When are you guys going to go to Israel with me? This will make so much more sense when we're together in Israel, right? But if this, is, if this is Capernaum here, right, and I'm looking south, Egypt and Africa is that way, right? Above me is like Turkey, right? Is that right? Yeah, Russia, Turkey, Kazakhstan, or one of the stands is up there, yeah, right? Then to my right over here, we've got the Mediterranean, we've got Jerusalem, we've got Nazareth where Jesus was born, right? This is the Sea of Galilee right here. To the left over here, which is now where modern day Syria is up here, down at the base of that cliff. Remember I told you the cliff where the winds came down and like blew across the water? Remember we played the blow across the water thing? Yeah. Okay, at the base of this cliff right here, these are all Gentile settlements, okay? So there's something really interesting going on here. Jesus, they're sailing away from Israel. They're sailing into Gentile territory and this today's story is going to take place at th with three different elements in a cemetery involving demons and pigs what do all three things have in common death. oh that's good i think about death i was thinking they're all unclean yeah they're all unclean jews aren't supposed to go into gentile towns jews aren't supposed to hang out in cemeteries and certainly demons i think qualify as unclean so we here we have the what's that and pigs, I left out pigs. Pigs are certainly unclean. Okay, so, um, so don't miss what a big deal this is, that the Messiah is heading over to all these like interesting places. Okay, verse 27. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. And for a long time, this man had not worn clothes. That's an interesting detail I hadn't thought much about. 
Imagine he comes running down to meet them. It's kind of awkward for everybody. Yeah? Um, he's not wearing clothes, or had, nor had he lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. Now, a brief word on demons and possession, and I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time on it because that would be like a course to teach, like one big... Has anybody taught a course on any of that stuff yet? Yeah, before the break, we did Angels and Demons. Angels and Demons. Who taught that? Steve. Oh, yeah, is that right? Steve that just left? Steve? Steve Thompson? All right, on. Well, then I'm not going to add... I don't think I really need to add much to that already. Um, In fact, maybe we'll just kind of skip all that. You guys kind of feel like you know everything you need to know? (laughs) <laughs> the one thing I always like is what, is what is Satan and his demons what's their only actual weapon lying, lying. yeah it's all they do is lie so what's the best defense against a lie truth. so maybe we'll just continue in the truth because nobody ever complained about a short teaching okay so, um, so let's pick it up in verse 28 read 29 when he saw Jesus he cried out and fell at his feet shouting at the top of his voice What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. Oh, wow, I just realized something. I didn't look up the Greek word for torture. But verse 29, for Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains, and he had been driven by the demon into solitary places. So um, the demons freak out at meeting Jesus. Now, in the story of Matthew, it's actually two men. And the reason why um, in the story of Matthew, it's two guys, and and it's in Luke, it's in one guy, I don't know. But I'm sure there's a good reason for that. But they run toward the boat. Maybe they were thinking they ran to the boat trying to scare the people in the boat, but end up encountering Jesus, and this man prostrates, prostrates himself instead. What I think is interesting is in the Greek... When he says, um, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high? Apparently in the Greek, it says something about why are you here when we are separated or something? Like we who normally are separate, why have you come here now? Um, Which is kind of interesting because um, there's this mutual understanding of who each other is and a mutual understanding that they don't go together like oil and water or what have you. And that's something the root of what the demon says. But the most important part I think about this, or at least the most fascinating part for me, is the demons, and it's plural, right? Is they have the actual knowledge of who Jesus is. Look what they just called him. Jesus, son of the most high God. Now, I didn't go back and look at the previous seven chapters from the book of Luke, but as far as I can tell, I'm not aware of anybody else, at least thus far in the book of Luke, who has actually spoken out loud who Jesus actually is. In fact, somewhere up in the future, you know, Jesus is going to turn to his disciples and say, who do you say that I am? And they kind of hem and haw a little bit. They're like, well, some say Elijah and... uh, some say, what is the other one? Daniel, Moses. What's the other one? No. A, a prophet. Some say a prophet. Some say Elijah. They kind of hem and haw until finally Peter says, uh, the Messiah, I think, right? Well, Jesus asked two questions. The first one was, who do the people say? Yeah, who do the people say I am, right? And then they, that's right. And then they answer. And then they say, who do you say I am? And of course, nobody's got the guts to say anything. So they all look at Peter because Peter will say anything, right? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, like, like Lexi. Just open your mouth and yeah, see what happens. Um, but yeah, Peter's like, I don't know, Messiah. But this is interesting to me. Like, the demons have an actual knowledge of who Jesus is, and the very Jews themselves are missing it. Now, there's an interesting thing about um, Jesus and demons, and it involves testimony, and without getting deep into the theology of, uh, theology of this, Jesus never accepts the testimony of a demon. Now, it's interesting. Even when a demon is correct, Jesus will tell the demon, shut up. (laughs) In other words, demons are famous for what? Lying. And even when they speak something true, Jesus is like, nah, you just keep your mouth shut, you liar, you know, over there, right? Because I don't want anybody to ever pay attention to anything you say, even when you speak um, the truth. So it's just kind of an interesting thing that these demons, they know who he is, like straight up who he is, and they call out publicly 
who he is, and they're terrified of him torturing them. And um, well, we'll get it. We'll get into the abyss next. So let's go. Uh, what happens in verse thirty and thirty-one? Uh, which I got love. Okay, so Jesus asked him, what is your name? And legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. Now, do you see what's going on there? Look at how there's like plural words and singular words. Jesus asked him, singular, what's your name? Legion, he replied, which is a plural word. You might have heard like, you know, a Roman legion is like 3,000 people or so. It probably doesn't mean there's 3,000 demons in there. It probably meant just a whole bunch of demons. But look what's going on. Clearly the demons are speaking through this man, right? So legion, meaning there's a zillion of us inside this guy. Um, but what I would like you to pay more attention to in this little thing is the power dynamic, which is going to play out again here in just a second. And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. What's the abyss? Anybody? You? Hell? Somebody say hell. Yeah. Final judgment. Final judgment. Yeah. I like that. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So the abyss, let's call it like a spiritual dungeon for demons. Uh, we see it in the book of Revelation. Yeah. And um, where does it say not to the appointed time? Uh, is that later on in this story? Or did I get that someone else, somewhere else? Ba, 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 ba. Anyways, oh, maybe that's in one of the other um, versions of this story. Oh, yeah, and it's in, it's in Matthew. In the book of Matthew, the demons say, don't order us to the abyss before the anointed, the, excuse me, before the appointed time. What does that tell us? What do the demons know? They're going there. Yeah. Isn't that radical? The demons know that they have a date with destiny. They know that they are headed for the abyss, and they're asking Jesus for a little, what do they call that? A stay. What do they call that? A stay of, stay of execution, I guess, yeah? Asking for a little more time. Like they're out on probation. A leave of absence. A leave of absence, yeah. They're trying to extend their time. Okay, now look what's going on here. They know who Jesus is, they know what their destiny is, and they know who is going to send them there, and it's all Jesus, right? Okay, so what happens then? Verse 32, a large herd of pigs was feeding there on a hillside, and the demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. What an interesting story, huh? So Jesus sends them into a herd of pigs. For some reason, I have in my notes about 2,000 pigs. I don't know how I know that, but maybe if there was a legion, eat one demon per pig. I don't know, yeah? And then um, the question is why? Why would Jesus send the demons into the pigs and then the pigs drown. Because they're already unclean. Okay. Nick? It's, it seems a little weird that like, if, the deep was, if going to the deep was an option and going to the pigs was an option, does it mean God had mercy on, on the demons by sending them to the pigs rather than to the deep? Exactly. Well, no, I have no idea. <laughs> so, yeah. Did it have mercy on them? Well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe, maybe because it's not the appointed time. And Jesus is like, no, your time hasn't come. Okay, go ahead. You got a, you got a theory, Lexi? Well, it's kind of different. Like, so they have this something alive that killed itself. Right. Demons don't stay in things that are dead. They'll so stay. where do they go? Exactly. Where do they go after that? That's a good question. If I have that, that's in, so I have it here. So all the things to the death, they, they're not going to stay there anyway. Exactly. Yes, Madison, what do you think? Well, that's kind of what Lexi just said, right? So if they're in, why the pigs, right? So just so you know, uh -huh. no, no, no. He cast the demons out of a guy. So the question, if I could like paraphrase, what it seems like we're saying is 
The demons come out of the man, and Jesus probably could have sent them anywhere, maybe even just set them free to roam around, but then they might have just roamed right into some more people that were around there. But he, instead, he puts them into pigs, and the pigs go down, and the pigs die. And I'm with Lexi. Once the pigs are dead, well, it seems to me the demons are now just free-floating again. So, you guys, there's a really good answer, and if I knew it, I would tell you. <laughs> this is one of those things. I've read, like, probably four or five different commentaries on why the pigs, and quite frankly, nobody knows. You want to make the, the pig owners mad? What's that? Is this due to the pig owners? Well, maybe, maybe it has something to do with his testimony to them, yeah? So, here's the thing. Here's what I think is a bigger point then why did Jesus send them to the pigs and what happened to the demons? The bigger important point is how they are under complete and total submission to Jesus. Jesus says, go into the pigs and away they go. Come out of the man and out they come. I just love this idea that th there's not just one demon, but quite frankly, maybe as many demons. That's a Roman legion, a legion of demons. And Jesus says, with the word, out. I yes. Like what? Like the, they actually ask you to yes. Why would they ask you? We'll have to ask him. No, I was going to say, ask him when we see him. We'll never see him. Madison. Do you think when Jesus cast out demons other than in the scenario that they really go to do this? Because they ask to not go to do this. Do you think when he cast them out? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's the appointed time. So, yeah, which kind of goes back, reflects back to Nick's point, which is, so was that a merciful thing he was doing? For, does Jesus have mercy on demons? Uh, Nick, and then we'll go to you, Trent, yeah? So, um, in Jude, there's actually, like, a talk of angelic beings being chained under prison until... Uh, in Jude? Yeah. Oh, Jude, yeah, sorry. I'm thinking so, Old Testament, right. New like, Testament Jude, sorry. Yeah, until yeah. the like, Revelation uh, right. starts. Uh -huh. I think that's where he's, they're scared of going, uh -huh. but I don't know, it just seems weird that Jesus wouldn't send them there, but right. at the same time, I think the people, the demons that are in Jude, or that I've talked about in Jude that are chained there, are there for a specific reason, and it's not for the wrong people. Right, it's for something else. There's a lot going on we don't know, clearly, yeah, Trent? Actually, you know what? I have no idea, but I'm not aware that we're going to be fellowshipping with demons in heaven. So I don't know. Yeah, good question. Yeah, I wasn't meaning to go there with that statement. I was like, we can, I, you know, I always like to say, you know, when there's something I don't understand, I'm always like, well, we can always ask God when we get there. And I was thinking, oh, we can always ask the demons when we get there. And then I'm like, well, actually, I don't, I don't think heaven and the pit are going to cross paths, but whatever. Unless they get saved. There might be redemption for demons. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it. Yeah. It doesn't, look, doesn't appear that way. What's the appointed time referring? Sorry, you've got to talk a lot louder than that, Zach. What's the appointed time referring? Oh, and the end times, judgment times. Yeah, at the end of the age when this earth fries and we go to live in the new Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. Kate's all excited about that, but yeah. <laughs> Which is either happening tomorrow, depending on who you talk to, or not remotely in our lifetimes. All right, good questions, you guys. Isn't this wacky stuff? I mean, quite frankly, this is really wacky stuff. Like, it's like, what does this have to do with anything? Okay, we'll get to a little bit of an application that, occur that applies to us. Verses 34 to 35. Now, this is actually kind of interesting because this involves people, which we know more about than we do demons. Verse 34. When those tending the pigs saw what happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were what? From the Greek, terrified. And guess when the last time that word was used? When Jesus calmed the storm. What's the connection? Power. 
the power of Jesus. They come and this maniac that's been living in the tombs who can break chains, as we're going to find out. He can actually break chains. Or did we find that out already? We found that out already, right? He breaks chains. No one's been able to do anything with him. They're happy living in a cemetery to keep him out of town. And they show up and there he is. Hey, guys, what's up? Probably wearing clothes, which is probably, you know, helpful too, right? Hey, guys, what's up? Yeah, no, yeah, I'm, I'm all good now. All that whole demon-possessed thing, that whole crazy thing, breaking chains, yeah, it's all done. I met I, Jesus, right? Wow, pretty radical right then. Okay. So um, remember, again, uh, first of all, it's funny, the herdsmen's reactions, they run off to go report everything. Why? Because <laughs> they're responsible for the pigs. Now the pigs are all dead. They're in big trouble. <laughs> so they you got to come see this. Otherwise, you'll think we sold all the pigs and made the money or something, right? Yeah? So, but also remember, these people aren't Jews. Why is that important? Because they're tending pigs. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's important because they're tending pigs. But it's important to this story because, remember, they don't know anything about the coming Messiah, right? They're not waiting for the Messiah to come. They don't know about the writings of David and the, you know, and the Son of God. They don't know anything. When the demons cry what did he say? You're Jesus, son of the most high God. It's not like the people standing around were like, oh, wow, Yahweh's son. No, they're, they're pagans. They're not Jews, right? So after the scene, these people come running up. First of all, they see a bunch of floating dead pigs, I'm assuming, right? 3,000 dead pigs floating, right? And here's Homie, who was crazy, you know, the day before. And now he's like in his right mind. And it's interesting. The word phobo means terrified at his power. So much so, that might explain what happens next. Verse 36. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. So this guy said, come out of him. And then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave because they were overcome with fear. So he got in the boat and he left. Well, isn't that interesting? Now, some people have speculated, why did they ask Jesus? Some said, well, because he ruined their economy. <laughs> 3,000 pigs, like, took a chunk out of their economy, right? Yeah. But there's really no mention of who owned the pigs, you know, what's going on there. I doubt that was it, yeah? More telling is perhaps that they heard from the pig herders about the miracle, and now they have the hard evidence right in front of them. This guy's been completely healed. And their response is really interesting. Get away. From us. Now, it's interesting because, you know, Peter says that to Jesus one time. Does anybody remember when? Get away from me. I am a, I am a sinful man. The miraculous catch of fish, which Peter would know because he's a fisherman that this is a miracle. Isn't that an interesting little concept? A miracle happens and someone's response is, get away from me. Yeah, from that kind of power. Isn't that interesting? Um, who's going to be in church, not this Sunday, but next Sunday? You guys going to be there? Unless you're going to the North Shore? Because I'm going to be, um, actually be teaching on the sixth chapter of Isaiah, and I'm actually going to get really into the whole terrifying experience of holiness. Yeah, it's terrifying. And we're getting whiffs of it right here, but Isaiah is going to get like a full-on shot, <laughs> like a shot glass, a shot of holiness. It's going to blow his mind. Trent? You said next week we're teaching? Yeah, like what, this Sunday I'm doing music, and then the next Sunday I'm preaching. So what is that, a week from Sunday? Uh, I can't hear you. What? The, the man's camp. Yeah, it's the weekend of man camp. Oh, you guys going to be up at man camp? Uh, all the guys are going to miss the holiness. Yeah, you'll have to watch the live stream if you want to know what it means. Man town, everyone's going Man, to. I didn't think about that. <laughs> Crap. Wow. Well, is it going to be like Chick Sunday at church? And I'm teaching. Maybe I'll teach on how Isaiah felt. <laughs> Well, Isaiah, how did that make you feel? Speechless. 
wow, you guys are going to leave me alone. Uh, it's going to be like, it's going to be like estrogen Sunday or something. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so back to the herdsman story, back to the townspeople, back to them being terrified by Jesus. Um, it's hard to be sure why they were so terrified, but I will say this. Even the most cautious and skeptical of the commentators that I read about this episode all spoke to the hardened condition of an unsaved heart that rejects the miraculous as being scary and terrifying. So if you think about the reaction of a hard heart, I know it's been a while because we only teach the book of Luke, what, one day a week or something like this and that. And I think the last time we taught where I'm going to was about two or three months ago. But hard heart. In the book of Luke, recently, where have we heard that idea? No. I don't blame you for not remembering it. The parable of the four soils. Remember that? The seed goes out to four different soils. And the hard heart, the first seed lands on the hard ground, right? And who snatches it up? Birds of the air, which may or may not be de uh, a symbol of demonic presence or whatever. But these people have hard hearts. They reject Jesus. They actually fit into the category of the seed that falls on the hard ground and is immediately snatched up. Okay? So there might be some connection there. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. Verses 38 and 39. I, this is kind of an interesting little interlude, right? I love scripture because people are so funny, and this is like one of those scenes. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away, and he told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Now, this is a really, first of all, why would the man want to stay with Jesus? Yeah, that's the way I feel about it. I kind of feel about it like, well, who wouldn't want to stay with Jesus? Especially if Jesus had just healed you of this hideous thing that has separated you from your life and your community, yeah? And then it's interesting, but Jesus says, no, go back to your people. Like, I don't know what's going on there. I, I wish I could ask Jesus, well, how come you told him to go back? Well, a couple of reasons I could think of. Maybe having a Gentile hanging around with him might have made it awkward for his ministry or made his ministry more difficult. I don't know. It seems like Jesus, you know, he didn't mind having, like, you know, people of ill repute hanging around with him. Um, maybe, maybe that's not it. But perhaps by telling him to go back, he's, um, there's a sort of a parallel teaching in Psalm 51 about when David repents. So Psalm 51 is David's sort of repentance psalm. And I'm going uh, to read a little bit out of it right now for you. This is what David says to God. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach sinners your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are a God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. So perhaps what Jesus is doing is saying, go tell. Because remember, other people, he said, go from here and don't tell anybody, right? But this is not what he gets. He says, um, what does he say? Return home and tell how much God has done for you. The exact opposite of what he's told some Jewish people. So clearly... Perhaps this is Jesus. Well, that was a kind of, that was a mixed statement. Clearly, perhaps. <laughs> Maybe it's not clear. But perhaps, as I speculate, yeah, he's actually anointing this man to be a missionary to the towns of Gerasenes to speak of these things. Perhaps to sort of send seeds out to these hardened hearts that perhaps some of those hearts will be softened. That perhaps years later, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, when word of the resurrection gets across the Sea of Galilee, that people will respond to the gospel because of this guy who apparently took the anointing seriously because look what it says. The man went away and what did he do? He spoke. He told all over town how much Jesus 
had done for him. And I'm going to guess he wouldn't shut up about it. By the way, it always leaves us in, in part, it leaves us in the gray area of Scripture. You know, the, one second, Madison. There's always this gray area between when Jesus seems to reveal himself to people and people accept him for who he is. And then he gets crucified and he's died and he's buried then he's resurrected and he walks around for how many days? 40, I think it is. Yeah, 40. And then he ascends. And then how many days now before the Holy Spirit comes? Is it another 40? I think it's another 40, right? So the question is... Was, Oh, so it's 10 days after. Okay, so it's 10 days after he ascends, right? That would make sense, Pentecost, right? Yeah. Oh, wait, Lauren, you're not going to want to miss this. It gets really good. No, I'm just kidding. You go. It's totally good. Okay, okay. We'll wait for you. Not awkward. What, my point is, there's all these people, and we remember, no Holy Spirit. So we don't know what do they know. When do they become believers? What if... This guy who's been rescued of these demons and he believes clearly that Jesus is the Messiah. Is our assumption in this room right now he'll be in heaven? Yeah? That's what I assume. Do you guys assume that too? When does he get blessed with the Holy Spirit? On the day of Pentecost? Even when he's over in Gerasene? You see what I'm saying? I just, there's, nobody ever talks about this. I've never read like a book on it or anything. But to me, in my thinking, there's this foggy, time period, right? Like sort of pre-Holy Spirit and dwelling, but post-experience with Jesus. What did they know? And were they saved? And how did they? Anyways, blah, 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 blah. Those are the kinds of things I think about with this guy. But hang on, I'm going to go in order because Lexi had her hand up first and then Madison and then, yes. Um, so I was Nick. wondering about the, now I'm going to get my Madison. Madison. Uh, <laughs> no, just kidding. Yeah. Madison, why don't you go while she collects her thoughts? Oh, it was. Okay, right on. Cool. Nick? So, um, yeah, no. I think about that all the time, like Old Testament being saved and like being saved uh-huh. before the Holy Spirit was coming yes. people. But it seems like, uh, I don't know, you know the verse, and I don't remember the reference at all, that says like, if you confess my name before the nations or something like that, I will confess you to the Father. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. yeah. It's like weird, because the same situation with the guy on the cross, like, mm-hmm. you know, there wasn't the Holy Spirit. Of Correct. Christ. That's right. What's the Greek word for paradise? It's like par- paradise or something. Yeah. <laughs> garden. I, yeah, I wanted to make sure you caught that. You'll be with me in the garden today. I just love that. Yeah. By the way, I love that thief on the cross example for a whole variety of reasons because it seems to answer a lot of theological questions. What if you never got baptized? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, how much are you responsible to do based on your, because of your salvation? Nothing. He couldn't lift a finger towards his salvation. There's a great visual right there. He can't lift a finger towards his salvation. He can't earn his salvation. He does nothing with his salvation, technically, of any earthly good. Yeah. Never is baptized, right? Doesn't know a whole lot about the propitiation of sin because of the blood of God's son, Jesus Christ. Doesn't know about the temple tur- curtain getting torn, which symbolizes the entrance into the presence of God. And yet, that day, he's with Jesus. So it lowers the bar, isn't it, of our understanding of salvation for people to get saved, which is what I love. Did you remember your question now, Lexi? Oh, thank you. We've been waiting. Yes. Uh, I was curious about the fact that this was a Gentile place. Mm -hmm. He told the guy to go tell people. And same with the Samaritan woman that he Uh did the water at the well. He told her to tell everybody. Yes. Yes. I was thinking about, yeah, that's true. Because the Samaritan woman qualifies exactly like, because he does tell her, he does tell her to tell. Which, by the way, I might be wrong on this, but my understanding of the the Samaritan woman at the well, I think she is the actual first human to recognize Christ as the Messiah. Yeah. Which is really interesting if you think about it, that it wasn't, that it wasn't a Jew. Yeah. That it wasn't a Jew. Yeah. And then the next person, I think, is the Roman centurion who actually says uh, he, was the, you are the, he was the son of God. Good stuff. Um, 
Okay, I, actually that's it for the teaching today. Uh, my applications are kind of like. Oh, you bah, 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 bah. Question, question. oh my gosh, a question. Yes, and Trish. Ah. Uh, what is it? Just make it up. That's what I do. Oh, yeah, that word. Okay, but what does it mean? Is there a definition? It just says torture. That's it. Torment? Rack? Rack. R A C K. Rack? Rack. Like getting stretched on the rack, torture, or like to rack your brain. Interesting. But thank you for looking up the word anyways. That means torture. Torment. I like torment. Like clearly it means bug, you know. I like torment, yeah. Um, what's that? A cog or a toothed bar. Yeah, obviously. Cause extreme physical or mental pain. Yeah, rack your brain. It's like not hitting your noggin with a spiked bar. Oh, I'm racking my brain. Thunk, thunk. Okay, let me just wrap up with one application. And, and yeah, sure enough, it's supposed to be a short lesson. We're going to be like two minutes shy or whatever. Yeah. Um, I just want to tell you a brief story because it was funny having um, Charles Price here. Um, you know, because I sat under his teaching for a year when I was at Cape and Ray. But he wasn't like the uh, principal emeritus of my school. The principal emeritus of my school was a Scottish man named Billy Strachan. And he had this one thing he always said all the time about going to Cape and Ray. And maybe I've said it to you guys before, so I'll say it again. Anyways, and that is, oh, it's very good for you to come here and to come study Jesus, and to study the Bible. I'm so proud of you. He says, but when your time here is done, Leave. <laughs> Go away. Don't come back. <laughs> Don't try to stay here. And his point was this. This isn't the real world. It's just not. This is a special time in your life to be together with a very interesting community of believers. It's like a greenhouse for spirituality which is one reason why I think I told you that in a lecture I gave you a couple months ago about don't waste your time here because you will never have this time like this ever again. Did I tell you about my son, Cozy, he went to Cape and Ray and he asked me before he left, Dad, can I work while I'm there? I'm like, work? Why would you want to work? First of all, no, <laughs> you're not a British citizen and there's nothing around there that's like sheep farms. I don't know, I don't picture my son as a sheep farmer on his day off or something, right? But then, frankly, no, you don't go to Cape. But here's what I told him. I go, look, what you don't understand is this. You're going straight out of mom and dad's house, my house, right, into this Bible school thing. And the reason why he wanted to work, just so you know, is he likes making money, and he, and he does. He's like, and he, he gets bugged because he's seeing his savings like you guys are right now, right? It's like, beep, right? You're, and he was, like, was kind of stressed about that. He didn't want to like lose economic ground, right, while he was there. But here's what I told him, and here's what I'm going to tell you. We'll wrap up on this. You'll probably, I can't imagine. I, so I'm going to be more firm than probably. <laughs> you will never have the opportunity that you have right now in this time of your life. Because once you leave here, like Hayden knows this already. Once you leave here, and I knew it when I was at Cape and Ray because I was Hayden's age at Cape and Ray. But after I graduated from college for the next, what was it, eight years, I had to pay rent, I had to get health insurance, I had to buy a car, make car payments, I had to get car insurance, I had to pay my electric bill, I had to have a job to pay for all of that, right? And, and then life just gets busy, for lack of a better moment. And when I got to do what Hayden's doing right now, I had such a greater appreciation than a lot of other people of, wow, for a whole year or nine months, whatever it is, this is all I have to do, right? I don't have to think about all that. I don't have to go to this job. I don't have to do this thing. So don't waste this time. But here's the catch, right? This is Billy Strachan now talking. You come here to grow. Don't waste your time. Feed yourself. Feed your brain. Feed your soul. <laughs> Be transformed by the renewing of your minds, right? But then get out of here. <laughs> because quite frankly, I, know this, I don't mean to say this to insulting you, but we don't need you here 
as much as the world needs you all out there, just like this demon-possessed man, Jesus didn't need him where he was going. But what Jesus needed him to do was go back to that Gentile town and speak of Jesus. Does that make sense? And so let that be your motivation and your goal while you're here to prepare yourself to go out there. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Lord, oh Lord, thank you that um, you spoke your word and demons fled from your presence, God. And thank you that we have your word, Lord. And so we cling to your word because we understand that it is what gives us life, Lord. It is what changes us, God. It's what brings us closer to you. So we thank you for your word today, Lord. And I just pray over everybody here in this room, Lord, that we grow greatly into you, Lord, that we might be use when you send us back to where we started. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen? Amen. All right. More fun at 4 o'clock, I promise.